Pro Group Management. Workers' comp that works for you. Welcome to Nevada Newsmakers on the broadcast today coming to you from Carson City. State Senator Melanie Scheibel of District 9 here for the whole show on an all new Nevada Newsmakers. What do you count on? You count on your power every day. At NV Energy, we've always powered what's important to you, but we're not looking at the past. We're focused on the future. While our standards are high, our rates will remain low. And our commitment to renewables isn't just meeting standards, but leading the way. Because you can count on more than just your power. You can count on the company who brings it to you. That's our promise. You can count on it. Safety. We all think about it. You think about it when he buckles in. When you check your mirrors and put away your phone. RTC thinks about safety too. In fact, we create it. Center turn lanes mean fewer blind spots. Bike lanes keep cyclists and you safe. Roundabouts reduce injury collisions, and all these crosswalks are designed to keep families like yours safe. Safety is your priority, and it's ours too. Every day, in everything we do. When in Carson City, Nevada Newsmakers records in the conference room at the Bank Saloon. Coverage of the 2021 Nevada Legislative Session is brought to you by Pro Group Management, workers' comp that works for you. Ahern Rentals is ready for your next project. Liberty Dental Plan, making members shine one smile at a time. And Southwest Specialties, creative, distinctive, beautiful. This is Nevada Newsmakers with host Sam Shan, a no-holds-barred political forum. Now, from the Nevada Newsmakers Broadcast Headquarters, here is Sam Shad. And back on Nevada Newsmakers, we are delighted to welcome back to the program State Senator Melanie Scheibel. She's of District 9, uh, 9 rather, um, and she's on Commerce and Labor, Chair of Senate Judiciary, and Vice Chair of Natural Resources. Pleasure to have you back on the program. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, I, I just have to ask you, it's kind of a goofy question, but the State uh, Democratic Party uh, pushed away Tick Segelblum for a uh, chair, and kind of moved all the way to the left-hand side and saying that uh, Tick was part of the establishment when he's probably been the most liberal uh, state senator and now on the uh, uh, Clark County Commission. What are your thoughts on that? And are you concerned that the state party may move too far to the left? I always think it's funny to hear people refer to our group of elected Democrats as the establishment because so many of us are so young and we're so diverse and I've only been elected for four years and so I'm still learning about the party, I'm still learning about the issues, I'm still learning about the legislature and so I sometimes forget that people are talking about me <laughs> when they talk about the establishment because that's not how I see myself, it's not how I see uh, Commissioner Segerbloom, it's not how I see most of my colleagues. We're all very collaborative and we work really hard to include a lot of diverse voices in our decision making and in our policy making and um, I, I, I love the team that I work with. Okay, but, but do you have concerns that policy-wise um, if the push is to go you know, further and further to the left that may, that may alienate people two years from now? That doesn't really concern me um, I think that it's always good for there to be a robust dialogue within our party. And I think that there's a lot of space for people to be further to the left, be further to the center, and still be effective. Um, the state party is one facet of this political animal, and um, I look forward to working with the state party in the next election cycle. I look forward to working with the state party moving into the next legislative session. Um, and I think it's okay that different parts of our party um, have different viewpoints. What do you think about uh, the fact uh, of the building being locked up? Um, even at this point, uh, here we are near the end of March. Um, uh, do you have any word on when the building is going to be open uh, to the public and to lobbyists? I don't know any more than anybody else does. We're all trying to calculate, you know, if the last staff member gets their vaccine on a certain date, what two weeks from that date will be, and um, I can predict it about as well as anybody. Have you been vaccinated yet? Yes, I have. Um, 
you know, with casinos being at a 50% level at this point and other businesses now at a 50% level, there's a lot of discussion out there about, well, then the legislative building should be open as well at this point, at least to a 50% capacity. The problem is that the legislature, you can't do the 50% capacity in the same way that you can do 50% capacity in another building because um, we are open to the public and we're open to the public whether our doors are open or whether we're open online. And I think that while we have talked about doing a hybrid system, and maybe we still will do a hybrid system, uh, it's a little bit different when you're talking about providing access to voters, access to constituents, and then there's also access for lobbyists to the building. And something that I worry about is uh, providing a pathway that makes it very easy for paid lobbyists to access their legislators and access the building, but that doesn't leave the same options open for um, constituents and citizens and um, you know local groups. If we have a 50% capacity, if we were to actually put a cap on the number of people who can be inside the building, that's something that we haven't done before. And so when we go online, there is no cap to the number of people who can watch online, the number of people who can call in online, the number of people who can par participate online and so I think that it's important that we keep that in mind too. Um, I've been talking to some lobbyists over the last couple of days and it's been interesting because where they were complaining at the very beginning of session that they had no access now they're talking in terms of we can watch three committee hearings at the same time which we weren't able to do before. What, what gains or losses have you seen for yourself in terms of information because in a citizen legislature it's so important um, that you get information from lobbyists because if they're not honest with you then they don't last in the business so you know how has that affected you I think that we've all adjusted uh, the hardest part for me was getting used to doing committee online especially chairing a committee when you can't see people's faces you can't give them the nod to go ahead and speak things like that but in terms of the information sharing I think that we have as well as possible gotten up to speed and it's good to remember that we used a lot of technology before um, we might have been in the same building, but still, a lot of what we did was, are you in your, a text that says, are you in your office? No, I'm not. Okay, I'll give you a call, <laughs> which really isn't that different from calling somebody who is currently sitting in their living room in Las Vegas from my office um, versus somebody who is walking down the street and I'm on my way to committee and we're on the phone. We have the same conversation. And I must say that uh, my ability to have access to you is pretty much instantaneous and I really appreciate that. Oh, thank you. So thank you for doing that. Um, let's talk about a few issues here. Um, ghost guns. Uh, what are your concerns? Now, uh, for people that don't know, you are a prosecutor in the Clark County District Attorney's Office. Um, so what are your concerns about ghost guns? Yeah, so um, one of the interesting things about the citizen legislature is that I do serve as a prosecutor in the DA's office in Clark County. Um, when I come up here, I don't represent the DA's office, I can't speak for the DA or any of their policies. I also, but you're the head of judiciary. You're the chair of judiciary. I am the well, and I also don't forget everything that happens back in Clark County. I don't forget what it's like to walk into a courtroom and prosecute a case against somebody who has seriously harmed another person. And in a lot of those cases, those are shootings. Those are gun cases, firearm cases, and um, so that experience definitely helps me to evaluate the danger of this new industry of ghost guns. Um, and I find it very frustrating in my work um, being able or not being able really to track specific firearms. Um, and we use a system called NIBIN that um, is a federal database that helps us see when a gun has been used in two different crimes. And you know that's like the, the back end way of matching incidents to each other and, uh, and following one gun through its lifetime and through its possession. And so, Every time that's get, that gets harder, we get less information. And I think ghost guns are you know, the ultimate in very little information coming to us about where a gun is coming from. Do you think that this bill is going to get through the uh, legislature this time around? I'm not sure. Um, you know, we're still waiting to see what happens to it on the assembly side. And I'm certainly um, ready to hear it if it comes to me on the Senate side. But there are always a lot of factors at play. And I can't predict it. Okay, um, you probably know that uh, your boss, uh, Steve Wolfson, the DA, was on the program a couple of weeks ago, and I asked him about uh, concerns um, having yourself and Nicole Canazero, uh, who's the leader, uh, both working in the DA's office, and now there are concerns about you know, the dual role of being 
both in the legislature and working at the DA's office. And one of the, you know, the, there's currently litigation going on concerning one of your cases. Um, and my question to him was, did he have concerns about um, if it goes badly, um, could other decisions based on your prosecutions be reversed? What are your concerns about that? He, he seemed to feel that, that the courts would not go back and reverse previous decisions. What, what's your thoughts on that? Because you've got to have concerns. Um, I'm actually very confident that the law is on my side here <laughs> and that there was nothing untoward and nothing unethical about my prosecutions. Um, I know both of the cases that you're talking about. I remember them well, and all of the evidence uh, proved the guilt of both of those defendants beyond a reasonable doubt, and um, I am very confident that, that the courts will get it right. Okay, but the other, the other side of this is concerns about somebody, and this has been an ongoing discussion for decades, as long as I've been involved in what goes on in the legislature, between uh, people serving in the legislature and also being seen as part of another branch of government. I think that it, it comes with the territory of having a citizen legislature, and that's true for a couple of reasons. The first, and I think the most obvious, is if you're not going to have public servants serving in the legislature, then who's going to be there? If you're going to eliminate everybody who works for any type of government agency or organization, you're going to be left only with people from the nonprofit sector and from the for-profit sector, from the private sector. Um, and I don't think it's a coincidence that there are 11 or 14, however many of us who work in government in our daily lives and also choose to serve in government in, in our legislative capacities. That's one reason. Another reason that I think sometimes people overlook is that one of the great things about Nevada's legislature is that you have practitioners of whatever field we're in, in the legislature, actually working on real-time policy. In other states, you might have a retired prosecutor. You might have a former prosecutor who last tried a jury, you know, a jury case five years ago, 10 years ago, uh, had never had a ghost gun in, in a case that they actually had to prosecute. But here, you get us in real time. So the issues that I see on the ground, the issues that Nicole sees on the ground, those are the same issues that come up in the legislature. And I think that it, it's an advantage for everybody to, to have that kind of perspective and policy making. Um, Steve Yeager, the Chairman of Assembly Judiciary, has been working on criminal justice reform both during the special session and now during this session. Um, what things can you see where you would be comfortable working with him on uh, some of the things he's working on right now? So uh, Chair Yeager and I work very closely together. Um, he is actually my representative in the Assembly <laughs> and I'm his representative in the Senate and um, I think we're we're always hopeful that we'll be able to decriminalize traffic tickets, and I know that that's been on the table for a couple of sessions now, and we're working on it again this session. Um, Sherry Yeager and I have also been talking a lot about bail reform. We took great strides last year in bail reform, but I also sat on the interim bail study committee, which came up with five proposals. So there are five more bail bills coming uh, this session. Um, Assemblymember Yeager and I have also talked about um, some juvenile justice issues that we'll be seeing coming through um, both his committee and my committee. And I think that we work really well together. And I think, I think we did a lion's share of the work last year. AB 236 was a huge step for Nevadans and we're gonna keep building on it. All right, let's take a break. We'll come back more with State Senator Melanie Scheibel after this timeout. Get in on the action at the Tamarack Casino in March. Win your share of the $75,000 Mad Money Giveaways now through March 31st. Plus five times points every Friday. Ooh, you get times at Tamarack. Serving Our Kids Foundation's mission is to serve homeless, at risk, and food insecure children in grades K through 8 throughout Southern Nevada. During the pandemic, Serving Our Kids has seen a 42% increase in the number of children served, providing more than 4,500 meals to kids in over 100 schools weekly. Serving Our Kids is powered by community support and volunteers. To learn how you can help, visit servingourkids.org.
Hi, I'm Renee Summer, our digital news anchor here at 7 at 7. Watch our streaming nonstop newscast immediately with your mobile phone. 7 at 7 is the new way for you to get every bit of local news you need in just seven minutes. Breaking news, local neighborhood news, weather and sports are just a click away. Reporters bring you all of what's happening in the valley from Roku, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, YouTube and more. Get every bit of local news you need from the RJ and LVRJ.com. Get in on the action at the Tamarack Casino in March. Win your share of the $75,000 Mad Money giveaways now through March 31st. Plus five times points every Friday. Ooh, you get times at Tamarack. This is Nevada Newsmakers. And back on Nevada Newsmakers, as we continue our conversation with State Senator Melanie Scheibel, let's move over to uh, your natural resources hat, um, innovation zones. Um, we're seeing a big push, obviously, very public, um, to be able to get this innovation zone for uh, blockchains, LLC. Um, and one of the questions that came up, and I had Kyle Rohrink on the program a week or so ago, uh, talking about water. They're trying to move water from uh, Gerlach uh, down through uh, uh, to Story County, it's about 100 miles, it would cross uh, tribe territory. Um, what are your thoughts on interbasin water transfer and the odds of getting something like that done in less than 20 years? I mean, literally, because Senator Reid, it took him 30 years to get the Truckee River operating agreement done. I think that uh, blockchain is being very optimistic and um, it, it, we, we've encountered this problem before. I, you know, the, the question around interbasin water transfers is not new, um, and it's, to me, it's very concerning, especially when we're talking about going through tribal land in order to accomplish that interbasin transfer. So um, I, I don't know what the solution is to, to that question, and I think that um, for some of us, that is top of the list of concerns, questions, curiosities about this whole plan is that do we have not just the rights to the water, but the ability to access that water in order to make the whole residential area work? Well, it would appear Mr. Burns has purchased the water. Yeah. Um, not all the water he needs, but, but a big chunk of it. The question is, can he move it from the farms where it currently resides into Story County, and that's that's the big question. Exactly, because it's one thing to own the rights to the water, it's another thing to have a mechanism for getting the water <laughs> from yeah, where it is. Southern Nevada, uh, Southern Nevada Water Authority. Um, exactly, so you can, own, you can have all the rights to the water, but that doesn't mean that you can move the water um, without some kind of infrastructure. Okay, do you, do you think for you that this is a block against you voting in favor of uh, creating that innovation zone that would carve out the 67,000 acres for blockchains to build their smart city? I would definitely classify it as a hurdle. It's a question that has to be answered before we can move forward with the, with the innovation zone plan. It's not the only question, but it's certainly a threshold question for okay, me. Okay, so what other questions do you have? Oh my, um, I talked to- well, we, we got time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, my, I talked to the, uh, one of the commissioners and the county manager out in Story County a couple days ago, or maybe a week ago, and um, I, I am interested in understanding whether or not there is a path forward for blockchain to work with the county to accomplish their goals w within the existing county structure. Um, and I, I want to hear more about those conversations between them and under, understand better um, why they feel the need to go outside of the, count, the current county structure. Um, I think that we are also waiting to understand um, some of the logistics of how this innovation zone would work. Uh, we were talking earlier about me being a prosecutor, so are they going to have their own district attorney? Well, it would appear so. I mean, that's the thing that, that strikes me is that, you know, the concept, I mean, everybody wants di diversification. Everybody wants to move us into the future. Um, but to build a whole government structure um, when basically you're running a company, um, you don't have all of the tools to be able to create all that unless you're going to spend an incredible amount of money. That's part of it. And then you also have to have the people to run that government. I, and well, that, that's what I mean. I mean, you, if you want to hire a county manager and a sewer plant manager and, you know, court manager and all the rest. Exactly. Exactly. 
And, and I would expect them to have public libraries as well. I visit my public library every single month, and um, I would be very sad to see a county that didn't have a public library in Nevada. What's the discussion about this privately in the hallways, without naming names, but you know, what are people uh, in the legislature saying to each other about this? Because obviously there's a huge push. Uh, there's been an incredible amount of money put towards this, and all legal, nothing uh, you know, no. uh, um, um, untoward. Um, but you know, the governor has gotten funding from blockchains, $50,000 to his PAC, $50,000 to the state Democratic Party and to legislators on both sides of the aisle. So, you know, are, are people feeling um, that this is something that is going to get pushed through or are they feeling like you are obviously at this point? There's just too many questions to answer in this session. I've heard a lot of other questions from, from other legislators. Um, we also don't have language yet for that bill and a lot of legislators are very detail oriented as they should be and it's, it's important that we have them on our team and they are are not ready to make a decision or you know make a judgment on on the proposal without seeing the exact language of the proposal that will change that will affect their ultimate position you know how this is how it's phrased how it's structured what the policy looks like on paper how we foresee that becoming reality um, my feeling is that there are still a lot of open questions in the legislature, um, but certainly there are people who, who have already developed a, a more robust opinion than I have. A positive or negative? Both. <laughs> okay, all right. Let's take another break. We'll come back with State Senator Melanie Scheibel after this timeout. One of the most psychologically damaging things parents can do to children in divorce is disparage one another, which is why I can't believe I even have to make this commercial. Half of your kids' genetics come from this person you're spewing hate about. Your children have the right to love you both, but more than that, they deserve to love themselves. Marilyn York might be a men's rights divorce attorney, but this is for every selfish parent. Shut up. Dimitri Prine here for Design Outdoor. Come visit Design Outdoor's store and backyard to see our wide selection of fire pits, barbecues, and pizza ovens, natural stone water features, and fountains, and frost-proof pottery. Our store and backyard are located at 11600 South Virginia, just north of DeMonte Ranch Parkway. Visit designoutdoor.com or call us at 851-9499. Located in the heart of Carson City, the Bank Saloon, a historic watering hole with a modern feel with a variety of classic cocktails featuring Nevada spirits, space for private events, conferences, and an incredible atmosphere. The Bank Saloon offers a great location to work and play. Come visit us, located at the corner of Fifth and Carson. We'll save you a drink. This is Nevada Newsmakers. And back on Nevada News, Meg, as we continue our conversation with State Senator Melanie Scheibel of District 9, um, there's a proposed amendment for equal rights, SJR 8. Um, tell us your thoughts on this. I was really proud to vote for it yesterday. Uh, we had a, a vote on the Senate floor yesterday on SJR 8, and a lot of members spoke very passionately and very authentically about how the Equal Rights Amendment is going to affect them personally and why it's important for Nevadans. And um, I, I was one of the, those members um, who felt it was important to recognize that all Nevadans ought to be treated equally under the law. And I was really proud to, to support the, it was, it's SJRA, I was proud to support it. And um, I, I look forward to seeing it pass this on. Okay, so for those that aren't aware of the details of this, just give us a thumbnail sketch of who this would apply to and, uh, and, and, and what groups would be brought under this? It, um, the amendment would be to the Constitution and it would say that every person in the state of Nevada is equal under the law regardless of their race, ethnicity, nationality, sex, gender, gender identity or expression, religion, I'm not sure if I said national origin already, um, and there any their physical and mental abilities. Um, you kind of surprised a bunch of people in um, early hearings um, where you said that you wanted to be treated as gender neutral as the chair. 
Um, did that surprise you, the response you got? Not really. Um, I, I know that some people are not comfortable with it yet or they find it extremely hard to make the switch, but I thought that it was important. And I think that plenty of people have caught on to chair or chair shibel and they do just fine with it. And I, that makes me hopeful that in the future, whoever uh, comes after me as the chair of judiciary doesn't have to be Madam Chair or Mr. Chair. They can be the chair. Do you feel that like the 70s, that this is a time of great change um, for various groups and that this is a part of that change? Are we seeing this across the country beyond just Nevada? I think so. I think we are seeing a huge wave of acceptance for people who are different, not just different from us, each other, but different from what we thought of before, the kinds of identities that we even considered before, we are becoming much more versed in intersectionality, which so many members of our community have dealt with for generations. And now finally, the rest of us are waking up to say, oh my gosh, when you have you know, these multiple identities, you're not just a member of your racial community or your religious community or your gender community, you're a member of all of them at the same time. Well, I think it is quite a revolution that's going on. Um, I thank you so much for being here. Would you come back again before end of session? Absolutely. We would, because I got so many more questions for It'd you. It'd be my pleasure. Thank you, and we'll be right back. Brian Culpa Photography was born in the rolling hills of Massachusetts, and now he can help you experience the stunning beauty of Nevada in a whole new way through the power of flight. Flying has always been a passion for Brian, and at Brian Culpa Photography, he can make your imagination soar. Brian has the creative mind and tools to tell your unique story. Experience the bird's eye view at brianculpaphotography.com. Hi, my name's Marilyn Miner, and I'm sure you'd agree that Nevada's a very special place to live. I was born here, and my husband and I have raised our family here. I feel it's a privilege to live and work in the Truckee Meadows. I especially enjoy helping my clients reach their real estate goals. Sometimes the smallest details provide the greatest satisfaction. I'd be complimented to talk to you about your next move. Call Marilyn Miner at Dixon Realty, 742-1280, or log on to MarilynMiner.com. Safety. We all think about it. You think about it when he buckles in, when you check your mirrors and put away your phone. RTC thinks about safety, too. In fact, we create it. Center turn lanes mean fewer blind spots. Bike lanes keep cyclists and you safe. Roundabouts reduce injury collisions, and all these crosswalks are designed to keep families like yours safe. Safety is your priority, and it's ours too. Every day, in everything we do. Pro Group Management specializes in providing industries with the necessary components to satisfy and exceed workers' comp requirements. Every business has unique needs and specific regulations. Pro Group Management stays ahead of the curve, providing up-to-date services to keep your industry in top form. Discover how we simplify your tasks, improve efficiency, and reduce expense to keep you moving in a positive direction. Pro Group Management, workers' comp that works for you. As always, you can watch Nevada Newsmakers on television, radio, audio and video, podcasts, and YouTube. We'll see you on the next broadcast coming to you from Carson City. See you then.